and instabilities that I want to discuss. The first one is a case where cells which are not allowed to attach on the surface spontaneously oscillate, and this is associated to experiments that were done in Bayreuth by somebody called Pavot Puraka. Uh, then I discuss blood formation. Blebs are membrane protrusion that come when a cell is not in good shape, for instance. And if I have time, the last example of instability that I want to discuss is how does a cell form a contractile ring? Now, the contractile ring is an actin ring that pinches the cell at the end of cytokinesis when the two cells want to separate. So let me first give you a, a short introduction. So here is my first example. This is a fibroblast cell, and the only thing that has been done is that this cell is not allowed to attach to any surface. And when you do that, the cell spontaneously oscillates. So the cell here spontaneously oscillates. Uh, and it can oscillate like this for a few hours. The, so what Pramod did is that he cut the cell along one radius, and what is plotted here is this radius as a function of time. So there is a long time drift. But if you take the Fourier transform of this, there is an extremely well-defined period. If I remember well, the period in this case was 37 seconds. Uh, so then, Pramod uh, is the same kind of experiments that you just heard about. He inhibited myosins using the statin, and if you inhibit myosins, the oscillation stops. If you destroy actin, the oscillation stops as well. And it's known that in these cells, actin is located in a very thin layer close to the cell membrane, which is called the cortex. So in order to have the oscillations, you need both actin and myosin. And there's a third thing that you need is calcium outside the cell. So if you diminish the density of the, the concentration of calcium outside the cell, the oscillation disappears. The other thing that Pramod did was to add a drug that inhibits or that blocks the calcium channels. And if you add this drug, the oscillation disappears. Now, we don't know what the calcium channels are, but this kind of suggests that there are calcium channels which are involved. So this is my first example. Uh, the second example is here. This is a cell which is in bad shape, which is going to die. And for this cell which is going to die, you see that it makes these membrane protrusions. The membrane pops out of the cell and then comes back, and the lifetime of this protrusion, which are called blebs, is something like 30 seconds to a minute. Here is a picture that I took from a paper of Guillaume Charas. What's labeled here is myosin. So again, you have the cortical layer and myosins are bound to actin in the cortical layer. And when a blood forms, the membrane detaches here from the actin cortical layer. There is a hole that forms, and then the actin cortex will reform here, and the blood will retract back. So again, in this example, actin and myosin are involved, and what's involved is the contractility of the actin myosin cortical layer. So these are the two examples that I want to discuss first. Uh, how will I do that? I go very fast on that. Over the last few years, we have built with Jacques Paul and Frank Ulisher, essentially, and Carsten Kruse, what we call the hydrodynamic theory for active cells. The idea is that actin uh, forms a network, but this network is not a classical network because myosin molecular motors are bound to this network, and myosin molecular motors consume energy all the time. So the idea is to forget about any, molecular, any local details and to try to make a theory for large length scales and long time scales, which is exactly what people do for hydrodynamics. So I won't go into the theory. Uh, we simplify this thing enormously. We only look at the one component system instead of looking at actin, myosin, plus the cytosol. Uh, we make it incompressible. Uh, we can relax these assumptions, but then the theory becomes infinitely complicated. Uh, and the idea of hydrodynamics is that you want to write linear relationships between fluxes and forces. So you have to decide what the fluxes are and what the forces are. Uh, one of the flux has to be the stress, because you want to look at mechanical properties. 
We also want to keep track of actin orientation. Actin is a polar filament. <coughs> Locally, actin will be oriented. So one of the force, one of the fluxes would be how is the orientation of actin varies this time. So we define the polarization and we look how it varies this time. And the other thing we want to keep track of, and this is the whole point of this theory, is that there are molecular motors in there. And the specific point, and the only one that we keep, is that molecular motors consume energy. Anytime an ATP molecule is hydrolyzed, you get an energy that I call delta mu here, which is something like 25 kT. So that would be the force. And the flux which is conjugated to that is the number of ATP molecules that you consume per unit time. So the idea is to consider these fluxes and forces, write the most linear relationship between them, respecting the symmetries. Now, what are the symmetries? As I said, actin is a polar filament. So if locally, actin filaments are more or less oriented, you define an average vector, which is a polarization. And that's a vector symmetry. So there's only one vector in the problem. Any vector that comes into the theory has to be proportional to this one. If you need a tensor, there is only one second order tensor that you can make with a vector, which is a quadrupolar tensor that I wrote here. So any tensor in the series has to be that. So that's when actin filaments are aligned. In the cortical layer, very often, actin filaments are not aligned, but they are, I mean, they are aligned, but they are randomly oriented. So half of them are in this direction, half of them in this direction. So it's not polar ordering, it's cinematic ordering. In this case, the vector here is zero, and you have to consider the average of the quadrupolar tensor, which is a so-called thematic order parameter. So we did the theory in both cases. I will show you one equation, which, which is in this case, but I will use a general theory afterwards. As I said, the main point is I want to describe active effects, which, I, which means I want to describe the effect of molecular motors. In the theory, any term which is proportional to this delta mu is due to the molecular motor. Well, then there is kind of a systematic way to do the theory, and I don't want to drown you under equations. So the only thing I did is I wrote the relation between the stress and the velocity gradient of actin. The way we describe the actin gel is we describe it at what physical chemists call a physical gel, which is something which is solid at short time and flows at long time. So I used here the Maxwell model. The Maxwell model is just this. At long time, this DDT here is negligible, and it's like a liquid, and eta is a viscosity. At short time, this one here is negligible. It's like a solid. There's a finite shear modulus, and the shear modulus is just eta over this time tau here. Now, there have been experiments in vitro, in particular in the group of Joseph case, and what these experiments tell you is the value of this relaxation time here, which is something like 10 to 100 seconds. What people also measured is the elastic modulus, which is eta over tau. And that's something like what I said yesterday, like the elastic modulus of the cell is like a 1,000 pascal. So we know an order of magnitude of this term here. Then there is a whole bunch of terms here that I don't want to describe. There is a coupling between the stress and the orientation of the active filament. And this is something which is known, and since it's known in liquid crystal physics, if you have molecules which are oriented in one direction, if you shear the system, you tilt the orientation of the molecule. This is due to this term here, mu1. So this term, and I don't know the exact value of this for actin, but this term is known in liquid crystal physics. The only thing which is new is this term here. The stress is a tensor, so it has to be a tensor. So it's proportional to the only tensor that I have, which is Q alpha beta. And it's proportional to delta mu. So this is the effect of molecular motors. So just by symmetry, what I get from that, that there is a stress due to molecular motors. Now you can try to make uh, molecular models for that, and Christina did many of these. The basic idea is that if you have a mini filament of myosin that you just served, it bounds to one of the actin filament, it's bound to the other one, and it shrinks the gel by pulling on the two filaments. So this is what's behind this coefficient, which is called zeta here. Uh, the other point I want to make is that as the tensor is, is Q alpha beta, this is not a pressure. It contracts the gel in the direction of the filament and it dilates it in the direction perpendicular to the filament. So that's what I want to look at. What is this effect of this active stress and how it, does it modify the properties of this cortical actin? 
Now, to be complete, I must say that this is only the symmetric part of the stress, and if you have a non-isotropic liquid, there is an anti-symmetric part of the stress. So that's all I want to say on this active gel theory. And I want to talk now about these oscillations. Before I do that, let me tell you how to describe the cortical actin layer. So my first description is extremely naive. I assume that the cell membrane is flat. And there are a few things which are known. The first thing is that the actin filaments grow, and they grow from the surface. So when they grow, you add monomers here, and the actin filaments are growing. The second thing is that they're almost parallel to the surface. But if you look in the plane of the surface, they are randomly oriented. So it's like a two-dimensional isotropic orientation of the actin filament, and they are all almost parallel to the surface. <laughs> of course, when actin filaments grow, myosin attached to the actin filament. So when there is no actin filament, there is no myosin, and then they bind. And here again, we're extremely naive. We use the first order chemical reaction for attachment of myosins. And what this tells you is that the further you go, the more myosins you have, and you reach a saturation value. So this zeta bar, delta mu, is the stress that you would reach to two myosins if the layer is very thick. And it varies with this like an exponential. So there is a profile of active stress that goes from here to here. Now, what the active stress is doing, it tends to contract the gel. So in this case, it's like a tension. You could pull on the gel like this. And the experiment that we have working on things like hysteria is that if you apply stress, you enhance the polymerization. I told you that polymerization occurs on the surface. In practice, depolymerization occurs all over the place in this layer. Now, we made some kind of rough approximation, which is that depolymerization only occurs on the surface of this layer. And depolymerization increases if the stress is increased. Now, this is enough to fix the thickness of the cortical layer, because if the layer is very thin and depolymerizes at the surface, the stress that's pulling, that tearing apart the filaments, is very small. So polymerization speed is very large, depolymerization is very slow, and the layer grows. And then the further away you go, the higher the, the, higher the stress, so the higher the depolymerization velocity. And there is a thickness where the polymerization velocity exactly balances the depolymerization velocity, and that fixes the thickness of this layer. So the thickness is here. Vp is the polymerization velocity. Tau m is the time scale of the chemical reaction of the attachment. And then you have a factor here that depends on the activity. If the myosins are very strongly active, the thickness is very small. Then if you decrease the activity, it increases and increases, and there is a finite value where this thickness diverges, which means that the actin filament is data of the cell. So that's our basic theory for the actin cortical layer. Of course, looking at the flat membrane is not enough. So we are theorists, so we went to a more realistic model of a cell, which is a sphere. Uh, so the sphere is here. The cortical layer has a thickness E. Now you need to fix the geometry of this cell. And what we did is we imposed, we assumed that the cell imposes the osmotic pressure difference between outside and inside. So it regulates the density of iron. And this is what fixes the radius of this cell. The other thing that we assumed, which could be changed, but we made this assumption, is that the tension of the cell membrane is constant. What that means is that if the tension changes, for instance, if the tension increases, the cell will bring in vesicles to increase the area of the membrane to relax the tension. So these are the two assumptions that we make. Now in this case, in the cortical layer here, you have stresses. One of them is due to the myosin motors. This is the active stress. But there is also a stress due to the curvature effect. And if you take a gel like this and you bend it, you create a curvature energy. So we take both of these things into account. We use this active gel theory that I showed you. And the answer is very simple. The answer is that Everything is as if the cell had an effective tension, and the effective tension is a sum of two things. It's the sum of the membrane tension plus the sum of an active tension, which is due to the cortical layer. And the active tension is just the thickness of the cortical layer times the active stress in the cortical layer. Of course, then you have to compare these two terms. So the membrane tension is known. It's something like 10 to the minus 5, 4, 10 to the minus 5 newton per meter. If you put numbers, and we have estimates of this active stress from experiments on motility, E 
is something like one micrometer. This active tension is something like 10 times the membrane tension. So in most of what I will say afterwards, the membrane tension is small, and the only thing that counts is the active, active tension which is due to the molecular motors. So what does it mean that there is an effective tension? It means that if you look at the osmotic pressure difference, or the pressure difference between inside and outside the cell, it's given by Laplace's law. So it's 2 over the radius times the effective tension. So you can apply Laplace's law for the balance of pressure, but you don't have to put the membrane tension. You have to put the membrane tension plus the active tension. And in this curved geometry, you can calculate the thickness of the cortical layer, which is given by this messy equation here. Uh, the only point I want to make but is that if you change the motor activity, is, uh, you is change the, the tension, you change zeta delta mu, but you also change the thickness. Yes? Is E the thickness? E is, is the thickness the of the cortical layer here. Okay. But, so when you but not in the bottom equation. It's not the thickness, thickness of the cortical layer is here. But the other yeah, E is not thickness. Oh, that's an exponential. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just okay, sorry. Um, so the first thing that we did is we decided to look at the stability of this uh, spherical cell. So you deform the cell, and we use a lower spherical harmonics. Uh, the lowest one is an n equal zero mode, so you contract the sphere isotropically. But if you do that, you, you change the volume. Now it's known that the permeability of the cell with respect to water is small. So these modes essentially don't exist because the cell at the time scale that we're looking at are compressive. Uh, so the next mode is something like this. So it's mode n equals 1. So if, in mo if you do a perturbation which is a spherical harmonic with n equals 1, it just shifts the sphere by a constant value. So the overall shape is not changed. But the mode n equals 1 will shift the inner surface of the cortical layer with respect to, this, to the cell. So it means that on the one side, the cortical layer is very thin. On the other side, the cortical layer is very thin. So that's mode n equals 1. And then we looked at mode n equals 2, which is this uh, shape that comes into it. So n equals 0, we don't consider. And modes n equal 1 and n equal 2 become unstable. They become unstable only the activity of the motors is large enough. However, there is no oscillatory instability of this mode. So there is a finite instability that grows exponentially and doesn't oscillate. So although this could be useful for some other experiments, for these oscillations, this is not useful. Now there is something which is missing here, which is the effect of calcium. The idea, which is suggested by many authors, is that in the membrane, you have calcium channels, and calcium can go in and out by these channels. Now, if calcium goes in, it interacts with the myosin molecular motors, and it changes the activity. If you have more calcium, you increase the activity of the molecular motors. Now, as I said, we don't know about these channels. We kind of guess that they exist, and the assumption that we made is that the channels are mechanically coupled to the, to the cortical layer. They are gated by the tension in the cortical layer. Then if you do that, you have some kind of feedback loop, which is sketch here. Suppose the cell has this shape here. The tension is low, and the channels are open. Then calcium goes in. If calcium goes in, it increases the myosin activity, so it increases the tension. So the cell contracts on this side, so it opens on the other side. Uh, and then the, the calcium ions are taken away by pumps, and you have an oscillation between this state and this state. So we did more precise calculation than that. Uh, we made some kind of phase diagram. So there are two axes here. This y parameter is just the active stress divided by the elastic modulus. Uh, there are two cases where I know that. One is the case of keratocyte cells. And for keratocyte cells, this ratio is something like 0.1. Uh, the other case where I know it is uh, the gross cone of axons, where both quantities have been measured in the group of uh, the F case, and the number is about the same. So this number y is something like 1 test, 1 one. There is another parameter here, which is called alpha. Uh, what alpha does is a parameter that measures the coupling of the channels with the stress field. Uh, I don't quite know the value of this parameter alpha. It has to be smaller than 1, but it involves a number of channels, the opening probability of the channels, and things like this. These are parameters which are not well known. 
Now, if you look in these planes, you find three regions. There is a region where the cells are stable, which comes in at very low activity. There is a region where there is an instability, and this is some instability is oscillatory, which means the cells start to oscillate. So that's at high value of the activity and high value of the alpha. And then there is a region where uh, there is an instability, but it's not oscillatory. In all these cases, the first mode that becomes unstable is the mode n equals 1. Now, there's a line missing here. At very low value of the activity, everything is stable. So there is no myosin. There is no reason why it could be unstable. Uh, the other thing we could calculate is the period of the oscillation in this region. And the period of the oscillation decreases with the activity. Sometimes it goes back up at very high activity. Uh, two things about that. First, you can measure that experimentally. You add the statin, for instance, and you can measure how the period of the oscillation varies with the statin. And what's always found is that the period of the oscillation decreases with the activity. Uh, the second thing is we put numbers. And the numbers are OK, which means the period of the oscillation is something like half a minute. So that's how we describe this oscillation. The point I want to make is that they are just associated to an instability of the cortical layer. So that's my first example. Uh, let me now go to my second example, uh, which is blood formation. So remember, the blood is a protrusion like this. It's a membrane protrusion. In the cell here, you have a cortical layer plus a membrane. In the blood, you only have the membrane. Uh, so we did this work in very close collaboration with a group of Eva Palo in Dresden. For some reason, her name has disappeared. And Eva had a very nice idea. The idea is that we shouldn't wait that blebs form. We should induce the formation of blebs. And the way she does it is she photoablates the cortical layer with a laser. So she makes a hole in the cortical layer. And instantaneously, at the same place, a bleb forms. So I showed you that there's a very nice movie associated with that. So you see, whoop, this is photoablation. And then you have the hole here. The bleb is forming. And then you see that actin is coming back into the bleb. And if she had waited longer, the bleb would retract. And we would go back to the original spherical shape. So when we do that, there is one part of the life of the bleb that we know, which is the nucleation of the bleb. We just ignore this step. And we just force it by uh, laser ablation. If you know how to do that, then you can look how the blood forms. So you should look at this curve here. There are a few parameters that we cared about. What is the height of the blood? What is the radius at the base of the blood? And instead of a radius, we use this angle here, which is the angle from the center of the cell, which is more or less A over R. Uh, the red curve here is the height of the bleb. So the bleb forms, it reaches more or less a steady state, and then the bleb decays. It's the same thing for the radius at the base, or for the volume ratio of the bleb. So after, I don't know, five seconds, the bleb has reached a steady state. It lives, in this case, uh, 10 to 15 seconds, and then it decays away. As I told you, the thing that we care about is the cortical actin. So we care about actin and myosin. So actin is here. Uh, just after the photoablation, there is no actin in the blood. So you don't see any actin. And then the actin comes back, and it starts to come back essentially immediately. And not only that it switched back its original value, it overshoots over the original value. And I must admit, we don't have any uh, explanation for this overshooting. Why is there more actin in the blood afterwards than before? You can also look at myosin. So I told you that this is a cortex. What's labeled here is myosin. Uh, myosins come back, but they come back way later. I mean, actin starts to come back immediately, but myosins come back way later. And when myosin reaches the original value of the myosin density, the bleb starts to retract. So what closes the bleb is the operation of myosins in the bleb here. So these are the what results. What is the function of blebs? Sorry? What is the function of these blebs? Uh, well, so there are cases where the function is well, well established. Some cells move by sending blebs like this. So that is called undergoing motion. Uh, I know many cases where blebs appear. I'm not so sure I would be able to tell you why the cell needs to make blebs. For instance, Jacques showed you a picture yesterday of cytokinesis. If you look carefully at this picture, 
when the two total cells start to separate, there is a formation of blebs in many cases. Uh, it's also, as I said, associated to a dying cell. So, uh, so the first idea was to take back our theory of the cortical layer. <coughs> so we tried many things, and it seems that the most consistent results are obtained if you assume that the cortical layer is solid. So it has a finite elastic modulus, which means that the viscoelastic relaxation time is larger than the uh, than the lifetime of the layer. So. Uh, and then the other thing that we did is we looked in the continuum elasticity book and we used what's called thin shell, thin, thin shell theory, which amounts to taking the elasticity equations and mapping them into a two dimensional problem. So if you do that, what you can calculate is the pressure inside the cell. So it's the pressure outside. This is a Laplace law. There is a curvature inward, so the pressure is larger here than here. And as I told you, I have to put here the effective tension. And then there is an effect of the elasticity of the cortical layer. If you want, you want to contract it, it resists. So this is this term here. If you look in the bleb, which I didn't draw here, the bleb has a radius Rb, and the only thing you have is the Laplace pressure. <laughs> so the pressure in the bleb is just the pressure outside plus the Laplace pressure. And if you reach some kind of steady state, the pressure has to be equal. And this gives you, for instance, the volume of the bleb as a function of the activity. Uh, we calculated, so here is the shape of the deformed cell. The bleb would be here. The other thing we calculated in this case is how much does the opening at the base changes when you, when you include the activity. And I'll show you in a second how we change the tension. And this turns out to be too small. So there is no way, if you do the theory like this, that you can explain the the geometric values observed for a blend. So we had to change the theory. And the way we did it is we assumed that inside the cell, there was not only a liquid, but there was some elastic modulus. Now, it's not so clear to me what's inside the cell, but it's clear that the cell is extremely crowded. And in particular, it has all kind of membrane structure. And if you try to compress the membrane structure, there is an elasticity. So we added this term here which only adds this term in the blab equation. And this time, we get something which is reasonable, which means the extra opening, which is due to the tension, is proportional to the activity, and is proportional to, to the opening angle of the blab. Now, with this, we can fit the data. So how did they fit the data? Uh, the very smart idea that they had is that they can measure the cell tension. So the way you measure the cell tension is exactly the same way you measure, you can measure the tension of a liquid. You swallow the cell in a micropipette and you measure the aspiration pressure. If the pressure is too low, you don't, the cell doesn't go in and there's a special pressure where the cell goes in and that gives you exactly the tension. Then of course you want to vary this tension. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, the way you vary this tension is you modulate the activity of the myosins. So you can introduce bevistatin, as you said. Uh, this is not the way they did it. They acted on what's called the raw pathway, which is a control pathway for the myosins. Uh, this way, you decrease the tension. They also have a drug which is supposed to increase the tension. Now, you see, the fit of the experiment, this point is never good. It's never good for any of the data. Uh, the conclusion that the biologists have on that, but I don't control that very well, is that when you add this drug, you affect the myosins, but you also change actin polymerization. So you don't only change the myosin, you will change actin polymerization. Now if you forget this point, which is a point where you would enhance the activity of the myosins, uh, you can more or less fit the data. You have two parameters to fit. One is the elasticity of the cortical layer. And this is 1,000 pascals, so this is the shear modulus of the cortical layer. The other one is the compression modulus inside the cell, and we find, a, we find a high value. So there are two points about that. The, the first point is, this is not the same modulus. One is a compression modulus, the other one is a shear modulus. And there is a factor of 1 minus 2 mu here, where mu is a Poisson ratio, uh, which could mean that this is almost incompressible. 
Now, if it's completely incompressible, there's no way you can form a bleb because the, vol the total volume is constant and when you form the bleb, you increase the volume. So that's where we are, but in order to fit the data, we need a rather large number here. Uh, so if we accept that, we more or less explain all the measured quantities of the blend. Uh, of course, you don't want to look only at the steady state of the blend. So what they did do is measure the height of the blend as a function of time. And of course, if you want to measure the dynamics, you have to worry about dissipation. So there are two sources of dissipation that we introduced. The first one would be permeation through the cytosol, and there is a model that's been done by Sharas and Mahadevan like this. The other source of dissipation that we added is dissipation due to membrane we flow towards the blood. If you make a blood, you have to increase the area of the membrane, so you have to pull the membrane, and there's a flow associated to that. Uh, it seems to, that this is a dominant term. At least when we compare to the data, this is a term that seems to be larger. And here is the initial velocity of the blev as a function of the tension, and we get a reasonable uh, fit, but we have one extra parameter to fit, which is the friction of the membrane of the cortical layer. Before I stop, I'll show you two more things, or one more thing. Uh, a very neat ex idea of experiment again. But the idea was, on the same cell, you shouldn't make one blev or two blevs. So, the first experiment, you first do one blev here, and then inside this same blev, you do a second blev. Now the reason is, if there is no actin in the blev, the second ablation shouldn't do anything because there is nothing to ablate. And indeed, you can make two blevs. So you will see, this is the first ablation. The first blev grows, it's easier to look here. And then there is a second ablation, and there is a second blev. Uh, and of course, in play, you can make four like this. If you need. So what this proves is that when you make a second ablation, there is something to ablate when you do a second one. So actin has come back already. Uh, there is a second experiment with two blebs, which is this one. Uh, so you make a first bleb, there you go, and then you do a second leg but another place. And what you want to check is whether there is a correlation between the position of the second blev, I mean the properties of the second blev as a function of the position. And there is none. Which goes with what I told you because the only thing I wrote is balance of pressures. So if it's a balance of pressure whether you make the second blev close by or on the opposite side, it's always the same thing. Now the second blev is always smaller. It's always smaller because the first blev has already relaxed the tension, the pressure really. Uh, yeah, and I think the chair is wanting me to stop, so I will stop here and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Uh, question? Maybe just speak loudly. So in the blood formation, you said there was more actin. Um, so what I'm saying is, normal. I mean, you the, the, the idea of the blood is in the early stage of the life of the blood, there is no actin here. So what you see here is not actin, it's myosin. But just after the ablation, there is no there is no myosin here. Then the fact if it stayed with no, that's the, not my question. That's not your question. <laughs> you, a few slides back, you showed okay. this curve where you had the actin coming back. You said it actually went past. Keep going. Yes. Overshot. No, there this, is this one. Yeah. <coughs> is that because it needs to heal the bleb and put in more actin for a while to heal the bleb, and then it doesn't need so much? Or I'm not able to answer. I mean, maybe. Uh, the, the, thing, the thing is, what you want is bring back myosins. In order to retract the blood, you need a contractile stress, and the contractile stress is due to the myosins. So it means there is a long period here where you have acting essentially without myosins. But I can't say more than that. Uh, I was just wondering, at, uh, at the point where you have a blood meeting the other one, uh, you have a sudden change in, uh, you yeah. have step change in the effective suppress tension. So, so there's a... flow, melancholic like flow. So, so this is kind of a steady state. Now, if you oh. know about drops and wetting, which turned out to be something <coughs> I worked in my early life, uh, there is something that looks like Young Law, which, which is called Neumann's Triangle Law, which tells you that if you plot the tension as vectors along the interface, the sum of the three vectors is zero. And in this case, the forces are balanced. 
and it's, it's verified here, of course. This is the first thing we did, we, we post that. <laughs> so I didn't talk about it, but we worried about that, of course. The question about the first part about that, and yes. the instability. So what determines the time scale of that instability? What is the slow mode? Well, uh, what is a, uh, um, what fixes a period? Yeah. So, so the time scale is a viscoelastic relaxation time of the, of the acting network, in this case. This is the only time scale in the park. Times the dimensionless numbers that depend on the opening of the, of the channels and everything. So, so the unit time is, the unit time of calcium dynamics? Uh, no. okay. The calcium dynamics is hidden in these parameters that I call alpha. And it depends a little bit on alpha. Um, I'm kind of confused about the issue of compressibility. You said the, the, that last result showed sure. that the thing was incompressible and you didn't expect it to. Why don't you, you expect it to be incompressible? The blood comes out. No, no, if it's, if, if, I mean, oh, why is that? If you take a polymeric gel of any kind and you measure the Poisson modulus, yeah. if you don't make the gel to have a weird result, you find something between 0.4 and 0.5. So it's always very close to incompressible. Yeah. Even a gel. Uh, now, in this case, it cannot be incompressible because if it were incompressible, it would mean that the gel would keep the same volume, okay, inside the cell. So the interior of the cell would keep the same volume, and as I assume that water has the same volume, there wouldn't be any blend. Yeah. So, and in any case, it has to be incompressible. So, so, so where's the water coming from then? Oh, oh, the total volume of water is constant. The total volume of water is constant. Yeah. So we assume that during the lifetime of the blend, there is no permeation of water in and out. Okay, but seem, oh, there are aquaporins, of course, in many cells, but it seems that even with that, the permeation constant is pretty low. So the, the total volume of water is constant, however, there's new volume yeah. taken up by... So, so the idea is that you contract the cortical layer, so you push on the blend, yeah. it expels some solvent to contract, yeah. and this solvent is what makes the blend. If you take a water-soluble gel, you press on it, there's water that goes out. It's called synergesis. Yeah. It's exactly the same mechanism, and this is the water that would make the gel. I have a question about your second lab. You said that the second lab has a smaller diameter. Is yeah. that, that's what's pressure, always observed. That's what's that always observed. If the, if the pressure is relaxed a little bit by the first lab, then the pressure is uh, the surface tension over R. So you would expect that the second one to be bigger. Yeah, so you, yes, so, so you're pointing out, uh, first, first of all, this is true. Laplace pressure has to be satisfied all the time. But you know, nothing tells you that these are steady state results. I mean, the blur was still growing and things like this. But the fact is, experimentally, it's always small. Right. Not much. Yeah. But, and the size of the second lab doesn't depend on where you make it. So you can't really explain. No, I can't really explain. Because it's that. a dynamic state. You can't explain. Yeah, I'm kind of escaping your question by saying that it's a dynamic phenomenon. But so maybe it oscillates? Sorry? Maybe it oscillates? No, no, we never saw blood oscillating. Oh, yes and no. Uh, the same person, Eva Palo, uh, had another instability with cells. She depolymerized microtubules. And in this case, the cell makes a blab, but the blab invades the whole cell. So it doesn't stop at a finite value, and it invades the whole cell. And that oscillates. So then actin comes back, and the new blab turns on the other side, and the new blab invades the whole cell. Uh, the instability is a little bit different than the one I explained, and the period is longer. It's like 10 minutes. I have a question about this uh, uh, balance of uh, surface tensions uh, mm -hmm. at the net. So you should have the third uh, interface that would balance the two different surface tensions uh, between the blab and environment, the cell and the environment. There should be something between the blab and the cell so, yes. for the balance. So, so, so what is that? Uh, wait a minute. When the blab and the cell. Oh, but there's no, yeah, no, because it's all, on the inside the blab. There's no, there is no interface. It's only water. So the only difference you have is you have a tension which is due to the blab, which is the tension of the membrane. You have a tension which is due to the to the cell, which is the tension of the context. But then in the triple line, you have just two forces that are uh, directed different, but they cannot be balanced. So this is one point. Uh, so yes, so there is a third force, which I'm forgetting now. Uh, I'm sure it's satisfied. So, 
But uh, then uh, in the second model, uh, which yes. was better explained in the experiments, you do have the... Yeah, I have the contractility that comes right. in. So then uh, it's a natural thing to introduce the third force, at least. Yes, in this case, there's no problem. But even in the first case, I, I'm sorry, and okay. <laughs> I, I, if we come back, I, I know the answer to this question. Okay, one last question, and we're going to break. On the Laplace pressure, you said that uh, it, there was some additional term on the flips. There was some additional term due to the gel inside the. Uh, so it's not cell. yes. I, I don't understand that at all. So, so what I'm saying is, if you contract a cortex and you have a gel inside, so if the inside of the cell is elastic, you will compress this elastic part, and that will resist the contraction, so that opposes the tension of the blood like the elasticity of the cortex, also opposes the contraction of the gel. And that's where this term is coming from. Okay? So that seems like that would be a volume term. I don't understand. That's a volume term. Are, so if you look, you like mean, that, appears, that appears in the equation. Uh, where is it? You see, this is the term that comes from the cortex. And this is a t the term that comes in the volume. This one has a factor E over R, where E is the thickness of the cortex divided by the radius of the cell. Just because of what you're talking about. This is a volume term, and this is a surface term. Okay, thanks, and we can read it.